going to do is in a couple minutes I'm going to have the tape turned on. Rolling. Interview of Mr. William R. Clements Jr. on 7 February 2002 at the Saratoga Springs Armory. Interviewer is Lieutenant Colonel Robert von Hassel and videographer is Mr. Wayne Clark. Mr. Clements, tell me where and when you were born. Born 9, 27, 23, in Saratoga Hospital, Saratoga Springs, New York. And did you grow up in Saratoga Springs? I go where? Did you grow up in Saratoga Springs? Oh, yes. I've been native, lived here all my life. Tell me Went a little bit. school, number seven school, and then the high school. And it was shortly after the high school. I only had three months or so before I was drafted. I worked with GE in Schenectady. And what did you do for Just GE? Three or four months. I worked in a Navy building where I riveted together the compass case. And uh, but it was short-lived because the Army, took, since I was 19, the Army took me, December of that same year, 1942. Tell me about uh, your family, mother, father, where did they come from? Did you have brothers and sisters? I have one sister, three years older than me, and uh, my mother and father, my father, lived in Wilton, which is just a few miles from here, and my mother had moved from Schenectady to Henry Street in Saratoga. Back in those days it was a nice street, and uh, they got married, and uh, my sister was born, and I was born, and they lived in Saratoga. They lived in uh, Broadway the first few years, until I was one or two years old. We got pictures of us. Mm -hmm. My father on the roof of the city hall. Yeah. And uh, then we moved to Carolina Street and then to East Avenue and Regent Street where I went into the service. So you were in high school in <coughs> Saratoga mm -hmm. when Pearl Harbor happened? Yeah, I was in the airway ward and on the block. Tell us about that. What? How did uh, you become an airway I tell you. Well, we walked around the block and made sure there was lights on and, and shades were pulled and so forth. But I remember one funny experience. I was in the theater, community theater then, in those days. And uh, I heard the sirens blow. From the city hall had a siren on the top back then. And uh, I thought that's an air raid, so I got to get out of here. I ran all the way up these streets, past here to my home and started telling everybody, yelling all the cars to get off the road and everything, and come to find out it was the all-clear signal. Ah. I'd missed the whole shot. <laughs> <laughs> now, how did you become an air raid warden? I don't remember. I was probably asked and volunteered. Did you really think that there was a chance that the Germans were going to bomb Saratoga? No. I mean, I, they do the coastline, you know, mm -hmm. more first. But the thing that bothered that when I got in England and saw how they lived, uh, a lot of people would have got killed here anyhow because they just pulled the shade halfway down and peeked at you out the windows, you know. And uh, in England, you, they had black covers for the windows and shades, and they closed it right up and lived normal life with lights on and everything. So I mean, it was quite a difference when I got over there to see that. Do you remember where you were when you first heard about Pearl Harbor? It was December 41. I don't know. Sunday I afternoon? Exactly. Yeah, I, I remember it happening and uh, Roosevelt coming on the air and all that, but... Were you surprised by it? Or? Oh, yeah. I really was surprised. Did you think it was going to change your life? I didn't probably think too much about it then. I was in, still in the middle of high school. Was Saratoga different during the war than it had been before the war? Did you oh, notice yeah, any the rations. You know, rations stand for gas and meat and food. Those are the things you remember the most. And, uh, especially gas where you couldn't drive. And you had a different kind of car if you were working in a war plant. You got more gas and so forth. Did it? 
it change your life very much? Not too much, and I, I wasn't driving. I mean, I drove some, but I didn't have a car. Let's move forward to, um, you're working at GE, and uh, you get your draft notice. And take it, take it forward from there. Tell us what happened next. Well, I was, the two buses of us went from here to Albany, and I was uh, inducted into the Army in December 42. And I see I graduated from high school in 42, June. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have a lot of time out. And then uh, where are we? You were in Albany. You got your draft oh, yeah. notice. And uh, I, you got two weeks off or something like that. And actually, January '43 is when I went. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the buses. We all went to New York camp. Camp Upton, mm -hmm. inductive, inductive Center, and uh, from there we went by train and we broke up because we were all local fellows and went to school together. And I ended up in Texas, Camp Bowie, Texas, and uh, the other half of the group ended up in the Pacific, California. Tell me about your time at Camp Bowie, Texas. What was that like? Well, it was field artillery, mm -hmm. 55 howitzers, 551st field artillery, Company B. That's pretty good to remember. And uh, I was there a year, but I, I was in the hospital, not the hospital, but the medical station so much. I've had allergies, and uh, all through high school I took shots from a doctor every, every week for these allergies. And then down there, that dust down there in Texas, the dust storms mm -hmm. got to me. So I was in the medical places so, so much and I was going crazy with it. So I, that's what happened. I asked, isn't there some place without dust that I, where I could breathe better and not be like this and, and do something more for the country? And that's when uh, they said, yo, Europe doesn't have any dust, and uh, <laughs> they knew what was coming. Maybe, but, uh, so I was sent over as a replacement. Did you expect to go to a field artillery unit? No, I never even thought about it. I had a year of training, so I mean, uh, I, now that you mention it, yeah, that would have been the place to go. But what actually happened when well, you got over? When, it took 14 days to get over there across the, across the ocean. I went over on an English tanker. And uh, I won't tell you what we ate all the way over. But uh, when we got there, they had us, there was a big group of us, and they had us out. In the, we landed at Bristol, England, and then trained us down to some other place. I don't know where it was, down south more. And uh, they had us all out in the field. And the sergeant in front of us started reading APO numbers. And uh, John Smith, APO 90, Tommy Jones, APO 140, like that, and then Clements, APO 1. And I just felt, you know, if you had a bigger number for me, it would have been nicer because it sounds pretty close to the front. Mm -hmm. And it was, it was the first infantry division. And uh, so I joined. That's when I joined the first infantry division, and I was combat engineers. And uh, we took more training down there in, in England. What kind of training did you do as a combat engineer? Bailey bridges and, uh, and Ponton bridges and I don't know all that sort of thing. They handed me a bazooka and something I could have that to to you. <laughs> what, did you. What was your first thoughts when you got a hand to the bazooka? It's going to be noisy. <laughs> and it was. I didn't, I never used them. I took training on it down there, but never used it much until, uh, you know, we got on Normandy. 
Can we? You want me to go from yeah, there? Yeah, absolutely. Because from there, we went to the bivouac area down in Southampton to get ready for D-Day. And we were all in tents down there, and uh, no mail could go out, and no leave of absence or anything. It was really strict watched over you. And, uh, and then we practiced some down there, and we lost some men out in the channel practicing when the German U-boats mm -hmm. got to us. But uh, then we really pushed the practicing and the, and the training down there, because we were getting close to the day. And then June 5th was supposed to be D-Day originally, and we were we loaded and we're halfway, not halfway maybe, but we're out in the pouring rain, and high waves, and I went up from England in an LCT, landing craft tank, mm -hmm. and uh, went all the way over in that thing, and that thing was just a flat bottom steel thing that bounced all over, and every half of them were seasick, and then we got word, I guess the higher ups got word, that it was called off because it was so rough and rainy. And uh, we, I remember we made U-turns or just killed time out there until the next day and then left either that night or continued on the rest of the way. And then uh, I didn't, we didn't know. We were all, not all of us, because I, I, our platoons were connected with uh, different regiments of the 1st Division, mm -hmm. infantry. And we were connected with the 16th Regiment. And we were the, one of the first ones going in. And uh, like I said, I went on an LCT. And uh, a lot of the guys you see in, in the movies when they show the war, right? went over and went over in a big ship and then went down the ropes to a landing craft. But, uh, I went on that LCT, and, and you know, some of us were, quite a few of us probably were new, mm -hmm. probably 40, 50 on the boat, and uh, all of a sudden you hear this peck, peck, pecking on the on the front of the boat, you know, where the ramp is, and then uh, shells started coming in, the 88th, and we were right there by the American Navy, as they were starting to fire, and then they were firing over our heads, you know, the rest of the way in. But uh, we had several direct hits. The first shell went through the little room like where the skipper, the Navy skipper, was running the boat, took his legs off, and then we were ducked behind the tank, figuring that's going to save us, and that's probably what they were shooting at. Hmm. But uh, some, some, another shell hit the ramp, it broke the ramp, and two guys came back past us with the rear ends were gone. They were all blood and everything, their pants were blown up. And, and then next to me, there was one, two, three, four of us hidden behind that tank. And the shell hit the 50th, 50 ammunition, uh, caliber ammunition for the machine gun on the boat, which they never got to use. But anyhow, I blew that up, and I looked over, and the two guys had the top of their heads gone. The guy next to me had his left arm off, and I was next, you know, and somebody was watching over me, and uh, I didn't get a scratch there. But then when we, the time to get in and get off the boat, we couldn't use the ramp. We had to jump off the back, and uh, it was about four feet of water, and I had the rifle and the backpack, and 50 pounds of TNT around my neck to blow up some of these obstacles in the, in the water to make pass. And, uh, well, I lost everything going in, trying to, trying to get in. And then uh, when I got on shore, we're running toward the cliff, I grabbed a rifle off the beach and then come to find out it was a German rifle, that didn't help me any. So they, my shells wouldn't, wouldn't uh, work in it. So uh, we dug, some of us started digging foxholes in the, in the bank 
there, because the Germans were up on the cliff, all dug in. And uh, I dug a hole and just about to get in it, and this, this uh, colonel, yeah, I forget his name, Taylor or something, was running down the beach yelling that, uh, you know, only people who are going to be left here are the dead and the one who's going to be died or going to die. Mm -hmm. So uh, let's get the hell out of here. So we got the Bangalores going and ran them up in some of the barbed wire and uh, blew up some pass up through and to make a opening for the infantry and everybody. And then, uh, what else, something else happened on the beach. Well, anyhow, uh, it was people were dying, you know, floating in the water like a bunch of corks in the water. A lot of guys, we had this rubber May West uh, life jacket mm -hmm. that you pushed and inflated and they had it around their stomach. You know, and they got hit, all you see was the rear end up. Their head was under the water and their feet were under the water, floating around, like a bunch of corks in a fishing trip. And uh, all this went on for some time. But uh, when we did get out of that hole in the wall, I, we started up the, to make a road, and uh, I looked back and uh, a shell, a mortar shell, hit that hole that I just dug, and some other guy was in it, so somebody's still watching over me. And uh, when we got up on the cliff, see, part of our, our main parts of our problem on Omaha Beach were two or three things. One, that three French had, were sending homing pigeons over to let us know who was there and what's going on. And they sent two every day, and in case one got shot down or something. Well, the last couple of days, they shot, Germans shot both of them down. And uh, so they, we had no idea what was happening as far as troops or anything. Mm -hmm. So uh, that was one thing. The Germans had moved up the whole regiment the night before. So we were, besides had them having the hiding places and the bunkers and everything else, they had uh, the advantage of numbers. And then when we got up there, we ran into two GIs that were laying there and they, they, they hit these shoe mines. We call them shoe mines because they blow your feet out. Mm -hmm. And they were laying there wounded and directed us through the minefields verbally so we could make it where they didn't. I think these are some of the heroes of the war. And uh, we didn't get too far that night. I mean, we were on one side of the hedgerow and the Germans were on the other side of the hedgerows. It seems like you can hear them talking. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's how close we were the first day. It took us 13 days, I figured, to get to Coma, which was our objective the first day. And it took us 13 days to get there. Partly because our flanks were, the English were getting, coming up with us. So our left flank was open. And uh, I said English, didn't I? Mm -hmm. and I said, excuse me, I thought it was excuse me for German. But uh, and another thing that happened on the beach was that, uh, what was it, 18? Yeah, out of 40 some tanks, only 18 got ashore. And that was supposed to be our backup. Mm -hmm. You know, these tanks with guns on them. And the thing that saved us there was uh, one Navy boat came right in as close as they could. They must have been hitting bottom. And put their rifle, their gun down straight, pank, pank, right into the hole in the wind of that bunker and blew the inside right out. Bunker's still there, because I went back on the anniversary circuit. And uh, they're leaving them for history's sake. But, uh, after the officers, lieutenant saw that I had a 
German rifle, he took it and said, you can't carry that because they'll think, if they catch you, you know, they'll think you shot somebody to get the rifle. So they give me a machete. <laughs> I figured that's going to be good. I hope I don't have to get that close to fight with somebody. It had came in handy for a machete. The, the digging in the roots and everything in the hedgerows. Mm -hmm. But uh, I didn't want to keep it very long. And we, finally supplies started coming in and we got, you know, new rifles and everything. But it, it was slow because that first couple of days were, you know, just to get people in. But like on the beach, you couldn't stay there because they just kept coming. There was no place to put anybody. You couldn't retreat. You see, the water's there. So you had to, the, the colonel was right, you got to go to it, you know. So that's what we, that's what we had to do. So, like I say, from then on, we we got to coma 13 days. And we dug in there. The infantry was on the hill by the church. And we were in the field behind it. And one day there, even, I was walking up the road, and an 88 landed right next to me in the road, and, mm -hmm. and slid down the road. It was a duck. There's a pre French working in the uh, the places, uh, ammunition places, and uh, they were putting sand in some of them. And that was another day I got saved. <laughs> but uh, that was a close call. But uh, we stayed there until the 24th of July, and then the 24th we moved over to St. Louis for the big breakthrough. Mm -hmm. By then, <coughs> in that almost two months, we got lots of supplies and lots of men ready for the breakthrough. Can I go back a second? Absolutely. One thing that I forgot, I made the pigeons for one of our faults. They didn't tell us what was going on. Another thing was the Air Force in those days dropped bombs and, you know, they weren't, today the bombs go all around and finding the target. But they dropped them two or three miles inland. It didn't affect the Germans on the beach at all. And the Navy was dropping their shells on the beach, and their Germans were up on the hill. So between all three things, and the outnumbered, I mean, it was a massacre. Mm -hmm. Until we could uh, finally got them going. A lot of the, a lot of the holes up on top where they were firing at us, a lot of them were Polish people. They'd used in the, up there, me Polar, you know, and didn't want to get shot. Mm -hmm. But, uh, but then after St. Lowe, we made the breakthrough. There's another bombing error, too. We made the breakthrough, and uh, when we got to the point, bombers came over by the south. The ground just shook from all the bombs, and they were landing miles away. But uh, it was terrible. But what happened there, they dropped the bombs short, instead of long. And when we got up to go through the line, mm -hmm. two fields of GIs were all blown apart there from the bombing. So that's another thing that happened. And then, like I said, someplace in Normandy, when we got going, we took a, our squad took a 10 minute break behind this French field house. I mean, uh, French house. and. Uh, the lady came out and told us about this airplane pilot that had been shot down and that they took him in and put some old clothes on him and put uh, Undertaker mute mm -hmm. on him so nobody could try to talk to him because he didn't talk French. And uh, she got talking about it and said his name was Len Shallon and I, he went to school with me. He's from Saratoga, a good friend of mine. So I mean it shows us that it's a small world you know, go over there and meet somebody like that. And I've heard when I went around on D-Day, 50th anniversary, t doing my talk, I took Len with me to get his talk in too. And uh, he could have made a movie out of that, that, what he did. He saw, he walked right through the Germans while they were having lunch, walked right down through them and nobody bothered him. 
And uh, he lived off of grass and stuff in the field and gardens when he first came down, but then the people fed him as they moved him from house to house. And uh, some of the ones he told us later on, they caught a couple of them who were told about this American still being around, and they shot Jim and shot them, the French. And uh, but he he lived all around, and one day he was out standing by the road when they were bringing American prisoners by, and uh, one of those prisoners was from Saratoga, and he just hoped he didn't speak out to the island or something. And uh, come to find out, the day we were doing the talk, he was there, the fellow that was a prisoner. So, I mean, small world. When you came to that farmhouse, was he still there? Was Lynn still at the farmhouse when you arrived there? No, no. No, they had moved him out. They moved him several times. And, you know, some of the attics and all over the place. But he got where well, he could see out windows and see what was going on. And Germans were, once that father, one or two of them talked, and said they were still alive, and they were looking for him more, too. Yeah. Do you still see Lynn? Oh, yeah. The fellow that just here knows him in the, in the Air Force. And Lynn was in D-Day, dive bombing with a small airplane. And uh, keeping, see, they, what they did is kept supplies from coming up to us. I mean, they knocked out uh, trucks was loaded with, G with soldiers and food and ammunition and all that. They knocked out the whole, and then that was our job after to clean the roads mm -hmm. of all this stuff that they'd blown up. Yeah, I still see him. Mean, he's in the hospital now. I mean, a nursing home. He's not in good shape. Mm -hmm. But I go to see him. And, uh, where are we now? We're up. You I were. Toward, we bypassed Paris. Right. Because the Free French wanted to do that. And uh, De Gaulle wanted to walk down the front of the parade. He'd been staying in England all these years. He wanted to leave the parade down the street. But they were all American troops that, that did the parade with him. But anyhow, we went by that. And I'm uh, using my notes. Uh, After Paris, you're fighting in northern France? Yeah, we had them on the run. But uh, we, uh, we liberated a city in France, our squad. Mm -hmm. Went up and liberated a little village. But I got pictures of me sitting on the jeep with a Frenchman with a bottle of wine on my head and cookies and all that stuff. And, uh, and that's interesting too because later on when I was in, after the war, I'm in Paris in the hospital. I meet him on the street and he gives me the pictures. Mm -hmm. So I mean, that's an interesting thing too. But, uh, let's see, the next, we had, well, we had uh, Siegfried Line. We broke the Siegfried Line, our squad broke the Siegfried Line. And, uh, in the service, you couldn't tell where you were until you'd been there two or three weeks, you know, in case you got pushed back or anything. So uh, I couldn't write home and tell them where I was, but the UP uh, reporter, photographer, was came up while we were just got through the Siegfried line, took pictures of us and our names, and my picture came out in the front of the Saratoga. And so uh, my family here knew three weeks before I could tell them where I was because the picture and the, came out the front page of the Daily News in New York too. The picture was breaking up the dragon's teeth. I mean it, that was at Aachen. Mm -hmm. I mean there were several places that got broken, but this was at Aachen, and uh, we could have taken Aachen. Then we had the Germans had gone run out of it and. Uh, but what happened, we, uh, supplies weren't keeping up with us. We were going so fast that, uh, like, when we broke the dragon's teeth there, we hadn't eaten in two or three days. So uh, when some of the jeeps went through with supplies, we 
baked a cracker or something, some sea rations or something off of them. And uh, what happened then, the Germans came back into Aachen. Then it was a house-to-house -house fight. Aachen was pretty well destroyed. But like I said, I went back after and it was rebuilt. But they left, they, the Germans left at least one building in each city with the bullet holes and shell holes and windows gone, just to remind the Germans, let's not do this again. Mm -hmm. And uh, then what came? The Battle of Bulge? After Aachen? Uh, yeah. And uh, the Battle of the Bulge. We got taken off the line because we've been on the line since D-Day. And we got passes. I had a three-day pass to Spa, Belgium, which is a city like Sardoga. It's a spa. Mm -hmm. And uh, even our mayor, later years, went over there and visited. And uh, I had a three-day pass to there. And I was there one day, and uh, the Germans were dropping the paratroopers in GI uniforms and all that. To that was the beginning of the bulge. They were to screw up the road signs and directing traffic and everything to follow up our advances. And uh, so I, we were called back to the company to get back on the line. And uh, I had a tough time getting back because I didn't know the password or anything. And uh, I was taken into I was taken into a room with an officer sitting there asking me questions about baseball teams and all these things to you know to show that I was really a GI because they were bothered with the German GIs. Mm -hmm. So then I got through there and it took me back to the first division and then to Battle of the Bulge. I spent. Christmas and New Year's, instead of being in Spa, Belgium, <laughs> I spent it out in no man's land. We laid 30,000 anti-tank mines between our whole battalion. Mm -hmm. We laid 30,000 anti-tank mines out in no man's land. We wore white sheets over us, camouflaged, but they knew we were there. They kept throwing the flares up. And you had to stop and freeze, and but uh, you know you weren't that far away from them either. You know, no man playing. But we got the line played, and uh, that stopped any Germans coming, those tanks from coming that way. We we're right near Bastogne, and uh, they knew we were there, like I said, because when the, our men went out to dismantle them, they lost the men because the Germans had come up booby trapped them. Mm -hmm. So we lost men there picking up the mines. Uh, we almost, uh, our objective, when now we get near the Rhine River, mm -hmm. and uh, our objective was, the first division objective was to take the bond and get the bridge. See, we all, everybody was after the bridges because we had a lot of Germans on the, our side of the water yet, and so they couldn't get back into Germany. And uh, we were bombing them, and, uh, and uh, artillery, I mean tanks, everything as close as we could, we were shelling them, trying to knock them down, especially the uh, bond when we got there. We, the Germans had just gone and they just flew the bridge. So uh, we were just north or west of, of uh, the famous bridge. Oh, the one in Remagen? Remagen Bridge. So we went down and the ninth hour had got there to blow it up and uh, found it intact by the way. Some part of it was destroyed. But uh, in Remagen, 
we they got the bridge, and uh, we I crossed on that bridge two days before it caved in, and another rear echelon engineer group who was there working on the bridge, and they lost about 28 men out there when the bridge went down while they were working on it. But uh, and the Germans now they were coming up trying to blow it up in, in, in boats and things. And they were shelling it and bombing it. And it finally got weak between the shelling and uh, our heavy tanks and things going across. And then went down. But we were over there then. And then uh, in the bulge, I was wounded once. Out of no man's land. The shells, 88s, came in. And they were coming close, so I jumped in a hole, but it wasn't deep enough. So it blew my helmet off and, uh, and knocked me out. I was unconscious for a day or so and came to the first aid station. And then I, they gave me some aspirin and went, put me back on the line. And uh, but then, Rumhagen, we were over there just a week or so, a week or two. And the 14th of March, I got hit. We were out on no man's land again. See, we had to go out and if the infantry's going to go across the stream, we had to go ahead of them and then mm -hmm. make a bridge or some way of crossing. So uh, we, we were out that night, a moonlight night, and then we had to go up over this hill. And Germans were there, you know, they, they see us. And they, I even saw the flash of the mortar not knowing who it was for, but it was for us. And then it, we always walked 15 feet apart, so you wouldn't, they wouldn't get a bunch of us at once mm -hmm. in the shooting and anything. So the shell landed between me and the fellow in front of me, a 19-year-old kid. And it went through my thigh and leg and uh, went into his back. And uh, they took us into a old barn and first aid, the medic was, came out and first aid. Then the jeep came and put us on litters and took us to an aid station and uh, they did some small thing and then they took us to another bigger aid station where they operated and took the shrapnel out and all that. In the meantime, I didn't know it, but uh, when I got back to my outfit after the war, the kid ahead of me, he died. He didn't make it. And, uh, and then from after the operation, they put us on airplanes. The sides of the airplanes were all stacked with litters, stretchers. And uh, I ended up in just out of Paris, just on the edge of Paris, plus a trip into Paris. And I was there from the 14th to the 5th of May when the war ended. And, uh, that came out in the paper too. I wrote a letter to my mother telling about the celebration of French planes diving and the, the colored streamers behind and all that. The war's over. Mm -hmm. And uh, we hadn't had word yet, but still, it did, we, within a day or two, we got word. Well, let's hold here for a minute because we're going to have to change tape. Yeah, they had bulldozing dirt in the holes uh -huh. where shells had landed around it mainly on this side of it. This was at the Remagen Bridge? Yeah. 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 But I came back on a, because like I said, I got hit over there, and uh, 14 days, it was about 12 days after that, and uh, I crossed back on an ambulance on the Fountain Bridge. Uh -huh. The engineers had Yeah, so up. the bridge had already collapsed then in yeah. between. Yeah, and they, they put the fountain bridge up. They it took a beat and shout to get shell. The Germans were shelling them like crazy and bombing them. They get a, some of the fountain done, and then they shell it and blow it up. They had to start over. They took a long time to get that darn thing up. Mm -hmm. So another. after you were released from the hospital in Paris, where did you go from there? Back to my mm -hmm. And where were they? There, I don't know if it's 
and he's it was near it, but it was near Nuremberg. That's Nuremberg area, mm -hmm. I always call it. Mm -hmm. it. It was about like here to Albany to go to Nuremberg. And we went quite a bit, which I'll tell you. Well, he's taping now, so... Oh, you're taping? Yeah, I, I just wanted to get a little of your conversation t uh, telling us about Ram Ramagan. Do you want to stop? Uh, yeah, we, we can stop. Yeah. Okay. We're up. Uh, tape 2, interview with Mr. William or Clements, Jr. on 7 February 2002. Uh, Mr. Clements, we were talking about the end of the war and you were in a hospital. <coughs> what, uh, what do you remember at that time? Well, that's I, well, one thing I remember, I'm a musician and uh, I'm in bed and hadn't been up to walk yet. And Glenn Miller's band theme song come out through the window, so I hobbled over there some way to see Glenn Miller. But he wasn't there. I mean, he got killed. Right. And uh, Ray McKinley, the drummer, was uh, leading the band, then, which interests me because that's what I played drum. But, uh, and once I got so I could walk around and so forth, they put us. You got to grew out of the hospital into tents in the back of the, the back of the hospital, mm -hmm. and they claimed this hospital was built. I got a postcard of it, and they claimed it was built by the Luftwaffe for their pilots and stuff. And uh, it was a nice hospital, but we were using it like we did a lot of buildings that they used. We reused them, but uh, in those tents. There's a lot of stealing and things going on <laughs> in mm -hmm. France, you know, black market. I mean, some nights you go to bed and you wake up and your shoes and the blankets are gone. You know, some guy took them and gone into the city, into Paris, and got some money or something for them. If you, cigarettes were a joke. I mean, if you had cigarettes, in Paris they had these urinals out in the street, mm -hmm. and you could see from your leg down. And uh, the MPs <laughs> would watch the GI go in there with a carton of cigarettes, and he'd come out, you know, holding money, and then the MP would go in and take it from the Frenchman and steal it. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, and if you had a bar of chocolate, you could get most anything, you know, mm -hmm. or candy or cigarettes or any of that stuff. Or, on the farms around there, that was before Paris, but on the farms, Fresh eggs, you know, we just had, we had C rations, K rations. Mm -hmm. You got a can of stew, and you didn't have any way of heating it, and it's just cold with all the lard and everything. It's cold, you know, that's what you had to eat. So if we got a, near a chicken farm, we'd get to trade soap or candy with some eggs, and uh, hard boil them in our helmet with a blowtorch, and have something good to eat. Get some of that German pumpernickel bread. But uh, back to the hospital. After I got out of the tents, they did the calisthenics and all that in the tent to get you back in shape, because my leg was still stiff for mm -hmm. a while. And, but we had uh, trips into the city, tours, you know. I got a picture of our group on a tour into the city, and I got several pictures. Well, I got some of the men on the street with cameras. Take a picture of you walking down the street, and then one of these places where you, I don't know, it's one of these, like we have in this country, where they put a quarter in and you get a bunch of pictures. Mm -hmm. But I've got pictures that were taken like that, and it says Paris 45 on it, you know. And uh, those are the ones that say Logan been using. But I was 21 years old then. And then from, anyhow, from there, after I'm all cured, the war's ended, send me back to the first engineers. And they put me in Company B this time, probably because they lost a lot of men after I got hit. They lost men crossing some of these rural rivers, some of these rivers. And uh, that was tough, crossing these rivers with just a rowboat. Mm -hmm. The Germans are right there, you know, with machine guns and you just have to take it. 
And he lost a lot of men that way. But uh, when I went back, all the guys that were privates were sergeants, and a lot of the old timers had gone home already. The first division ended up in Czechoslovakia and uh, came back, and now we're in, a, in German barracks that they used near Nuremberg. I don't know if there's a village near it. I don't. We never could go any place there. So. The only place we went was in Nuremberg, mm -hmm. like here to Albany, 30 miles or so. But uh, Bob Hope came there to Nuremberg one time, put on a show, and I got to meet him. And uh, another time I was there in uh, this great big stadium, and I looked up, and in the front row of the balcony was this Chick James who went to school with me. Mm -hmm. So I got to talk to him. And then the fellows that, the fellows that, that were in my outfit, the field artillery, they were tails taken base. And now I'm sort of limited service as a replacement, but uh, they're still in the States taking basic training. <laughs> you know, and I've been through Normandy and I've been through France and Paris and all this. And I'm still writing to them back in Texas. And finally they came over about the last couple of weeks of the war. And uh, so I got to see some of them. I don't know how we found out where we were or they were found out where I was, but we got two or three of them when I went to school and came over. And we, we had an old box camera that we found over there. Took pictures and I'd send the tapes home, mm -hmm. I mean the film home. And, and they'd get them developed here. But uh, then after the war, we, I had a good time for a while after the war. I, we, we had men in our office, in the, in the army you don't know if they're, you know, lawyers, carpenters, plumbers, I mean, you're just part of a group. And we had, we found out that from headquarters company that uh, we had a guy from Tommy Dorsey's band, one from uh, Sammy Kay. We had three or four big time musicians. I played in a dance band in Shadoga, but not mm -hmm. like that. So anyhow, we formed, uh, we built a field house too, for engineers, we built a field house so we could have movies and things. And then we formed a dance band his captain, played trombone, was the leader. And I played the drums and uh, was a vocalist. And we traveled in Nuremberg quite a bit, played for the USO and the Red Cross dances and things. And then one time, three of us had a jeep. They gave us a jeep to go to Switzerland. I mean, not Switzerland, uh, Czechoslovakia. There's a place over there that built or made uh, brass instruments. So they sent us over there to pick up some more trumpets and different instruments. Mm -hmm. And we had a lot of kinds of German money and stuff. So uh, everybody gave me all their money and I was supposed to buy instruments. So, uh, so we got a three or four day trip out of that. And then, uh, like I say, we played in Nuremberg mostly. But then Saturday I had it made too. Saturday they had a big, like a football, just a level ground field there. So every Saturday the battalion passed in review and then stood for rifle inspection. Well, the jeep came over and picked me up in the barracks with, and my drums in the, in the, in the jeep and uh, took me over to the field and I played the drums while they marched. And, uh, just play street beats because I'd been in the drum corps. And uh, they marched in review and then when that was all over they stood for inspection and the jeep took me back to the barracks and I wrote letters home. So I mean, I ended up with some fun. But uh, from there, I was there until September, warned in May, so I was there until September. And then got the call. I had enough points, 82 points or 84 points or something. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, so I had enough points to come be one, one of the first ones coming home. So uh, we went down to Lahar by train or truck, and uh, I got on the, it was a small world again, not small. Uh, the boat I went home in was a, uh, a victory ship or some sort. I had the name of it written down at home because it came out in the paper. But the big sign on the side of it, I came home with the Ninth Army that took the Remagen Bridge mm -hmm. that I crossed. The great big sign that they made crossed the Rhine and because the Ninth Army had captured it, you know, they had that on the side of the boat coming home. So I forget whether that was a three-day trip or something, three or four. And uh, it was during the World Series. It was on. Uh, there was all kind of pools going on for the World Series. And uh, came back and landed in, was it North Carolina? And uh, I forget. My sister came to see me. She was down there someplace. Mm -hmm. in school. But, uh, and then from there you, you didn't stay long and you got a train up to Camp Upton. Not to camp up in Port Dix. Right. Port Dix was where they were discharging people. <coughs> and uh, I was there probably a week before I was discharged. And then I got a train, it was $15 for the train from Port Dix to Schenectady, New York. And then I got some mustering out pay, part of my mustering out pay. And then you got the rest of it later mailed to you. And ended up in uh, Schenectady. Friends came and picked me up, and came home. And uh, my mother and father lived on Marion Place then, mm -hmm. and had a big house. They rented rooms in the summer to summer people, and in the winter to Skidmore people. And so they had a room there, stayed there, and. Uh, Life got sort of back to normal, except one day some kid shot a cap gun off and I hit the deck and, you know, of course it happened. And uh, I went back to the church choir and met a teacher who was teaching. She lived in Mariahville. Mm -hmm. I was connected. And, uh, so we went together and got married in 51. And uh, had three children. Three children? One in Seattle, the lawyer. One in Boulder, Colorado, who designs and repairs backpacks mm -hmm. for a sporting, low sporting good company. And Peg, my daughter, lives in Sedoga. Mm -hmm. And has two daughters. The boys aren't married. And uh, they're only 47 years old. So. No Russian. <laughs> but uh, we enjoy the granddaughters. And if I run out of work, I'm a cabinet maker. Oh. If I run out of work, Peg's always got furniture to build and so forth. I build all her furniture in her house, build all my furniture, I put an addition on her house. I did general carpentry. For years, I, I got on. That's how I got started. I came home and got a job in the farmer's hardware store, mm -hmm. and uh, there wasn't any future in that. But I, you know, it's a job. I had to have money. My father worked there. That's probably how I got the job. Yeah. But uh, Dick Evans, who was a high rank in the VFW, state VFW, and everything here, a black man that. Well, my best friend, and uh, he died now a few years ago. But anyhow, uh, he came in one day and said, "What are you doing in here, Clement?" Said, "You know, counting screws and bolts and sweeping the floor." You know, so he said, "Why don't you, if you don't want to go back to college, why don't you you know, on the job training?" Mm -hmm. So uh, the VA was right next door in City Hall then, and Dave Burke. 
who wanted to charge the VA and then and, uh, and I had met the Swedish contractor by selling them nails and things and he's a artist with tools and I asked him about would he take me on and he said yeah so I went to Dave Burke and got the forms and filled them out and uh, on the job training and uh, took four years apprenticeship and I've been 56 years at it now. Still doing some when I'm not, but I laid up this this year. I had two operations on my ankle mm -hmm. and uh, haven't been able to do much. But And then the story that Sarah Logan put in the paper about the Battle of the Bulge mm -hmm. and my picture in it, and it told about laying the mines and so forth. It was the last two years ago, Christmas. 16th of December was the day the Bulge started. We always meet on that day of the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, they put in the paper, and the story was kind of screwed up, but then he, they put it in the last thing, that Clemens is a retired contractor. And I haven't had to call since. So I think that's the way to retire. <laughs> Read in the paper. <laughs> so that's what's, what's happened. I still like to do cabinet work. I do a lot of kitchens and a lot of bookcases and custom built things and the furniture. I like to, my shop I added, I worked with two different contractors and then when they all retired and quit, I added a shop right to the back of my house, mm -hmm. my garage, and I go right into work and in the winter I don't have to go out in the cold. And uh, I still like to go back there and, and build things. I'm doing some work now. Are you enough to retire? Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you involved with any other veterans groups? A life member of the 420, life member of the Purple Heart, life member of the of, uh, what else is there? I'm in the Battle of the Bulge. Mm -hmm. our, our group meets our unit meets in the Latham four times a year, but then there's a uh, There's one other I'm a life member to, Purple Heart. Yeah. Good. Well, let's go back and talk about some of the things that we went over somewhat quickly. Let's go back to uh, to England, where you were doing your training before D-Day. Did you get out to the English countryside? Did you meet any of the English people? Well, we got into this city uh, because I remember going to dances and things where they had a band and everything. And then you come out at night, you know, you couldn't smoke, or, which I did back then. Mm -hmm. uh, you couldn't light matches or all the cars had these black flippers over their headlights and all that. You just uh, bump into people. And, in Belgium it was worse, but I don't want to change your subject. But no, go ahead. I mean, <laughs> you, come out to, you come out of a bar in Belgium and it's black, you stand there and first thing you know, your leg getting wet. The guy next to you, <laughs> maybe they take cut that. No. But I mean, you never knew, it was pitch black and Did you make any impressions of uh, life in England at that time? Uh, how did they treat you as an American? Well, there's three things you've heard of before. Mm -hmm. that, the, that the French, the English soldiers didn't like the American soldiers. Because they're over-sexed, over-paid, and over here. <laughs> and that's a famous expression. And did you ever come back to that? Did you, you know, yeah. think? Uh, what was it they used to say about uh, the English are just unhappy because they're underpaid, underfed, and under Eisenhower? Yeah, I've heard that one too, yeah. Uh, you know, one other thing I did do, might be interesting, is on the 30th anniversary of D-Day, I went back. Mm -hmm. Every five years, the First Division had a battlefield tour, they called it. Every five years. and. Uh, 
I was got the information and I was said, gee, that'd be fun, but I'm working. I can't get off work. Because if you didn't work, you didn't get paid. I mean, the carpenter. And uh, so finally, when the 30th anniversary came, I said, I'm going. This, this is May and June, because it's for D-Day. And my wife couldn't go because she's teaching school. It's the worst time in the world. Mm -hmm. So my son was senior in college. I said, I'll take him as a graduation present. So I took Phil with me. He was 20, 20 years old. And he went through the whole thing with me. And uh, he was the kind, and he admits it now, that He's not patriotic at all. He had the long hair and uh, all the things that irked the father. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but took him with me. And you know, he didn't even act too nice over there at first. He, he, he's a vegetarian. So the one, he couldn't eat a lot of the meals, so he bought some German bread and bananas and he'd walk with his dungarees on. We were in all his suits, you know. He's the dungarees on with a banana peel hanging out of his pocket. And, you know, just enough to ignore, you know, get you excited. But anyhow, when they had the, we had, we went to Ireland first on that trip and then to England. I mean, then to, yeah, England and then to Paris. And out of Paris, we came down to the beach, had a special train. They fed us like four o'clock in the morning out of the hotel, special, just to feed us. Special train go down to Normandy. And uh, we went down there three different times. One time was a big, there's a village, vacation vill village on uh, Omaha Beach now. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had a party in there with the mayor and everybody, they gave us a medal about D-Day and so forth, and uh, all the old-timers were all in the windows watching, looking at us, you know, so they finally opened the door and, and they come and they wanted to shake hands with us, you know, because they remembered the younger people didn't know what it was all about probably, but the older people knew that we liberated them and freed them and so forth. So that was kind of nice, and then they had uh, my son and I stood on Omaha Beach together, and he was 20 years old, and that's the same age I was when I called in there 30 years before, so that was quite exciting. And he picked up a flat stone, a little thin flat stone on the beach, and we had this 1st Infantry Division patch, a decal, mm -hmm. and he put it on the stone and gave it to me for Father's Day, which was nice. But then, one of the, about the third day we went down, we went to the monuments, we went to the cemetery, because uh, while we were in the cemetery in Normandy, Omaha Beach, there's a lady with us, with this fellow, just a year or two older than my son. And she was in England, and her, this boy that was with her now, 30 years old, was born when her husband was getting killed in Normandy. So we found his grave. They'd never been there before. Found his grave and laid a wreath on that grave, and, which I thought was nice for the, the boy and his wife and mother. Did being there seem to change your son's? Yeah, I was, that's why I was the last. Well, we had the ceremony on D-Day on the beach. They had, uh, we're up by the cemetery. They had all of our first division flags and everything come in, and they had, uh, the, the different countries that were involved in uh, freeing the French and ending the war, uh, each country had a flag, and as they raised it, their country's band played the, their yeah, Star Spangled Banner and so forth. They played their own uh, national anthem, and that got to Phil. And he told me later that. Before he went, he was the kind that uh, go to a baseball game and when he's singing, uh, <laughs> he wouldn't stand up, you know, in the, the beginning like he was supposed to, in the national anthem. And, uh, and after that, he said he was the first one of every, every ball game. So 
So I mean, it, it changed him. So uh, he still writes to me about it. How it changed, changed his life. Well, let's go back there for for a moment to uh, to Omaha Beach. Um, what were you thinking when you were in that LCT? I was going to be killed. <laughs> I mean, you were scared. As soon as those machine guns started hitting the front of the boat, they were reading that thing from Eisenhower. Mm -hmm. Every every boat, I guess, had to read that thing about Eisenhower now invading foreign soil and. God bless you and all this stuff. And he was in the middle of that one that started pecking on the front of the, the the boat. And then the shells started coming in. And you see this guy up there with one leg, you know, and uh, well, it made you wonder. And then so many of the guys laying on the deck, just seasick, they couldn't move. Did anything in your training prepare you for that? No, I don't think so. Were you, what did it feel like seeing these things right next to you, all around you? It was a mess. I mean, I mean it's probably something you don't even know how to think. I mean, it scared you, wondering if, you know, the next one might get you. But you kept moving, right? You kept, when the door opened, you went out on the beach. Uh, we jumped off the back. We jumped off the back. The ramp wouldn't work. But, uh, yeah, you had to keep going, you know. I'm wondering today whether my boat got back to England. Because they were supposed to drop us off and go back and get another load. And I still wonder if they ever get out of there. I mean, if they, a few more shells, and they probably couldn't move. What kept you going? Bodily, you mean? I don't know. I want to get out of there. I so, mean, nothing you can do, just do your thing. And were your officers and sergeants talking to you at that time, or could you hear anybody, or did you no, know what you were going to do next? Not there. No, just that one colonel that was running on the beach got us moving. But everything was disorganized. I mean, your squad was part here and part up the beach and I mean you all landed in the wrong place pretty much. So when you got to the beach you sort of hunkered down in a position and then this colonel came along? Yeah, well we were on that cliff. Mm -hmm. That's when I was digging that hole. So by the sea wall? Yeah. It's just sand going up and then grass on top. Uh -huh. Point to Hawk was just to our right. That's right by the cemetery now. The rangers went up there and then found that they'd already taken both the guns. So they got a lot of men lost for, you know, without needed, but they didn't know. And nobody was moving on the beach before this colonel came by? Oh, sure, there's dead people all over the place. But was anyone going forward? I don't know. I don't. I mean, you know, you couldn't keep track of people. And I know we got the Bangalores out and started running them up into, into the barbed wire to blow it past, too. Mm -hmm. Tell me about how the, tell me about putting the Bangalores out. How was that done? Well, they're long pipes that you put together and just keep pushing them up. Did somebody actually have to run forward with them or to get them under the wire? Would you no, well, if you're lucky, you put it <coughs> in the wire, through the wire. If you don't, somebody's got to go up and they don't usually come back. Because you're a dead duck up there. Like I say, these, I mean, it was, everything was their advantage. I mean, in this cliff and then the level part. And then the bunker's here, the bunker there. Somebody, that trip that we took, somebody, a Frenchman, had bought one of the bunkers, I guess, took the turret out and uh, had a picture one to put in and was living in the thing. And the one that wasn't being seen, of course, five feet of cement. You know, 
And the one on the right, we, we, that ship came in and blew that one pretty well. The old gun was still there, but it was all rusty, and, you know, 30 years later. The English had a museum there, I forget the name of it, but uh, we went to that museum too on that trip. And, uh, had a movie shown the actual day, and and then it had a museum and like first division uh, mm -hmm. thing with the outfit on and all that. We went back once after that too on our 25th wedding anniversary. Uh -huh. Took my daughter. We were in Paris, so we rented a car. No, we went by train down to down to Cain. And then a cane rented a car to uh, to go down to the beach, and we, my daughter and my wife and I, sat there having a picnic on Omaha Beach. It must have been strange having a picnic then. <laughs> yeah, because there wasn't any picnic the first time. Were you were you thinking about that when you were having that picnic with your your wife and your daughter? Is it coming back to you? No, there was kids on the beach swimming, and you know, the terrible different world. And then this uh, little, little village there with a restaurant and a bunch of cabins around with people driving around, you know, you didn't think of it that way. I thought of it when I had my son there standing on the beach because we were all alone, you know. Mm -hmm. Did it seem strange that uh, you're, when you're back in Omaha that uh, all this, you know, happy activity is going on and People are having a, you know, a nice day at the beach, and this is the beach where so many people got killed. Yeah. You, you read pictures, some of it. I mean, you still see all those bodies floating around the water and stuff. And a lot of, like I said, only two, very few tanks got out of it. They all, most of them died right in the tank. Let's let's move ahead to uh, Aachen. When you were in Aachen, were you involved in any of the street fighting there? No. Not you, the street fighting. No. Not the street fighting. You were outside we of the city. We got them through the dragon teeth and that, and then they call us if they have any, you know, streams across or anything like that. We, we, we a lot of places like Aachen do. We're firing rifles, but uh, you had your rifle with you all the time. But we did a lot of mine sweeping mm -hmm. on a lot of the roads to make sure. And everything was mud over there in France. We built roads out of trees. Just kept falling trees, one right next to the other, to drive on. Mud up to your knees almost. Mm -hmm. Now, the bazooka you carried, did you ever use it in combat? Yeah. Tell us about that. Well, I was, we were ready to use it. I mean, we we fired it every so often just to make sure it worked and everything, and aim at a target. But I remember one time in Normandy, I guess it was, that uh, we got word the tanks were coming down the road. So I was there behind the hedgerow, aiming at the road where they were coming, but they didn't come. Were you a pretty good shot with a bazooka? Yeah, I hit them once in a while. What you had to aim at, see the tanks, they had tanks could out uh, shoot ours and the way we beat them was numbers. And the only way you could beat them is get behind them and shoot the rear end of the tanks. Mm -hmm. The shells bounced off everything else. And they had a range. They could sit there and shoot at you and you couldn't shoot at them because their range was at 88, at a longer range. So yeah, what we did mainly, I aim at the tracks, mm -hmm. blow the tracks and so they couldn't move. Because it, even the bazooka, some of those tanks they came out with, uh, wouldn't penetrate. Did you feel like it was a... Uh a useful weapon, or did you think it was? Oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it could be used for other things besides, you know, half tracks or any of those things. Mm -hmm. 
And you said when you were in the hospital, you, you went to a Bob Hope show? No, that was after I got back to my outfit. After you got back to the outfit? He was in Nuremberg. Uh-huh. Put on a show. What was that like? It was just like the ones they show on TV. He went to every, every war and every place. And uh, it was good. He had two or three pretty women. They get the guys all shook up, you know, <laughs> and uh, tell us a few jokes. <coughs> the only thing that burned some of us up, he came. We had noticed three times he was coming, and we took that trip three times, sometime in the rain, and uh, something happened. He couldn't make it. So, I mean, the, finally the third time he got there. And that's when I saw this part from Saratoga. Now, let's, speaking of Saratoga, let's move, move ahead again. When you got back uh, after the war, did you have any trouble getting used to getting back to civilian life? You know, you spent a lot of time in, in, in the field in combat in France. Now you're back in Saratoga. Is it hard making the adjustment? Well, not too bad. I mean, like I say, the kid shot the cap off that day. Made me jump. But as far as... I mean, I don't remember that. You know, I was home and... My folks were there and were back, sort of back to normal. You had people that you knew. Meet a lot of the guys that made it through it. You felt a special bond with the guys who had been oh, through yeah. it? Yeah. Well, we're coming down to the last few minutes, so I'm going to give you an opportunity uh, to speak about anything else you'd like to. Before I do, I'd like to ask, when you look back at it all, after all these years, is there one particular thing or one particular feeling that comes up the most? I don't know. I mean, I mean, the Margaret Bridge and the Battle of the Balls, the Battle of the Balls was tough. What do you remember? Cold. Cold. You didn't have the equipment. I mean, we didn't have supplies. They didn't have good cold uniforms until Korea. You know, they, they had some heavy equipment then, but we had nothing but a raincoat. You dig a foxhole, as soon as you get to a, an area you think you're going to stay, dig in, you dig a foxhole with that little spade through the roots and everything, and then you just about got it deep enough to get in and we're moving out. And then you dig another hole. <laughs> that goes on that goes on forever, you know. And when you do get in it, you lay in there with your helmet or a pillow and just a raincoat over you and then there's water dripping on you from the condensation from your raincoat. And uh, that's a change of subject. But I mean yeah. these are things that you think of. You get home and get a bed with a blanket. Do you feel like it changed your life? Oh, yeah. How so? Well, it, mean, it makes you more positive about life. I mean, you know it could end any time. <laughs> you see it end very quick over there. It makes you, you know, want to do things that are advantage to yourself and other people. And, and love of country. I mean, I probably didn't think about, you know, the country that much in high school. Studied, you know, studied in high school. But I mean, as far as how to live and all that stuff. Is there anything else you'd like to, to add? I just say, nice meeting you all. <laughs> nice meeting you. <laughs> Wish I could have done a better job. You did a great, great job. job. You had mentioned earlier talking to me uh, that you had been involved in building the cells and so on at so Nuremberg. Much. Could you tell about that, please? Our battalion. 
built the cells. I mean, re remodeled cells. Mm -hmm. They had some iron cells there, but we remodeled them. Put high walls around, and uh, like I said, Gering, a big one. They had to build a bench for him to sit on. And then he, he took poison. He had a pill in his tooth or something that yeah. they said that he killed himself before he was going to be hanged. But the trials, anytime you see anything about the trials on, the, in the, on television, all the guards are first infantry, big red one, patches on the shoulders because they're the ones that did all the guarding and everything. They were more than the infantry men. Now you said you remodeled the cells. What? What had been well, there previously? Just, I don't know, make sure nothing there that they could use to... Hmm. But what, you said you remodeled them, what what, how, what was the building used for? I guess it, it could have been a jail. It was a jail. Because okay. they had metal doors and, mm -hmm. and bars and things. How long were you involved in constructing these cells? Several weeks. So you were there for most of the trial too? No. Oh. Okay. Uh, no, the infantry, I mean, see the ones that didn't go home, mm -hmm. you know, the ones that stayed. The first division stayed there for a long time. After I came home, I was one of the first ones out. And then they stayed a long time over there. And, uh, but like I say, all the guards were first infantry division. I'm sorry? Okay, thank you. Right. I thought I, I thank just, you.